You're listening to Tim Bolkley's 5-Minute Bible. What kind of model makes sense for understanding the nature of Scripture? What's a good Christian way of thinking about the Bible? An awful lot of people come to this question and they have the picture of Moses on Mount Sinai in their mind. The Bible, they think, is dictated by God, word for word and written down by human beings and passed on to other generations. But is that a Christian way of thinking about Scripture? If you look at the Bible itself, there is almost nowhere else, apart from Moses on Mount Sinai, where that picture seems to be operating. Since I wrote a commentary on Amos, an awful lot of biblical studies seems to come back to Amos. So let's look at how the prophet received God's word, at least on some occasions. Amos chapter 7 This is what the Lord God showed me. He was forming locusts at the time the latter growth began. It was the latter growth after the king's mowings. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beg you, how can Jacob stand, he's so small? And the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. And so it goes on in other vision accounts that Amos gives in verses 4 and following of that chapter, and then at the beginning of chapter 8, and then, more strikingly and terrifyingly, at the beginning of chapter 9. My point here is that at least on these occasions, Amos received God's word through a conversation, a discussion with God. There are, of course, other Bible characters who discuss with God. Abraham's a famous case in point in Genesis chapter 18. When God says to Abraham, in verse 20, How great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how grave their sin! I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So, verse 23, Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to stay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And God replies, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. And then Abraham haggles with him. It's not my place to speak, but suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking, and there are just forty-five. What about that? And the conversation goes on as Abraham gradually beats God down. Revelation from God to Abraham seems to have been a conversation, even like haggling in the marketplace, and not at all like God's dictation to Moses on Mount Sinai. And then there's the case of the four Gospels. Have you ever wondered why we have four Gospels and not just one? I mean, after all, if God was dictating the Bible, couldn't God have dictated a perfect account of Jesus' life? It's often said that the reason we have four Gospels is so that we have several witnesses to Jesus. Each Gospel notices things or tells us things that the others don't, and each tells the story in their own way, so that between them we have four different but correlating uh, pictures of Jesus. It's like tri triangulation when you want to find out where you are and you l take three lines on the map. With four Gospels, we have a much better take on Jesus than if we just had John's version, or Mark's version, or Luke's version, or Matthew's. Each of the Gospels is a witness to Jesus. Maybe that's what the Bible as a whole is, a witness to what God has done. If the Bible's a witness to God's dealings with people, then we'd expect John to sound like John, and Matthew to sound like Matthew. Paul to sound like Paul, and Peter to sound like Peter. We'd expect Jeremiah to be full of emotion, and Isaiah to be equally full of emotion, but differently. Because if they're all witnesses, rather than people taking dictation, then we can relish their differences and enjoy them, appreciate the things that each notices and tells us, and even, perhaps, listen to them arguing with each other 
and with God. Oh yes, we need to talk about arguing with God, but that will have to be another post because my five minutes is up and I'm into overtime. Bye for now. See you next time.